I'm really pleased to be here today as part of Digital Leaders Week. And I guess it would help if I did a very quick introduction. My name is Glenn Ochkor, and I'm part of the team here at Scott Logic. We've been working on supporting the public sector to do amazing things with tech for nearly 20 years, starting life working with financial services, but soon moving to work with the public sector a lot more. We've worked with a huge range of organisations from DWP, HMLR, DFE, DLUC, a whole bunch of acronyms, Scottish Government, a load of them amongst others. We work across the whole public sector, as I'm sure many people on this call also do. And it's that breadth of experience that's led me to be thinking about what I'm going to be talking about today. This isn't actually the first Digital Leaders talk I've given. This time last year, I was privileged enough to be talking about exponential evolution in a digital world. Hence me sharing this slide of my own evolution over the years. That particular talk went into various and different evolutionary areas. From the law of accelerating returns to the difference between transformation and evolution. And I was also able to share some of my favorite evolutionary facts, like how sharks have existed for longer than trees or crocodiles are longer than grass and dragonflies are even older than dinosaurs. You see, that talk was all about evolution, about changing and growing. But as part of that, what I also wanted to do was touch on a particular type of evolution, around how people can work together and the importance of symbiotic relationships and working towards those from a digital perspective. Now, symbiotic relationships are ones where every single part of an environment has a role to play, where everything is balanced and where every single part of it can work together deliberately or accidentally to thrive. And it was that which came to mind not too long ago when I started thinking about what I wanted to talk about, talk about today. It's all about ecosystems and not dominant organisms. All will become clear over the next however long we talk. But before I get on to that organism talk, I, I just want to share a very quick couple of stories just to illustrate a point. Now, I was at an event not too long ago, I, I won't say where or when or who else was there, but during it, we heard a talk from one local authority about their digital needs and how they wanted to make sure they were working with a broad range of suppliers as part of, and in, in their terms, a digital ecosystem. At this point, a representative from a, a supplier stood up to speak. Now, this was no SME. They were there on behalf of a major player in the digital space with thousands upon thousands of staff. And they were what I'm going to call today a mega supplier. They stood up and thanked the council speaker. And then they started talking about how proud they were to be a, a supportive and active member of their ecosystem of suppliers that the, the speaker had been talking about. They felt that their company was investing its people and time to actively engage with other suppliers and support them to build a collegiate set of relationships, which led to everyone thriving. Well, I'll be honest, I nearly spat out my lukewarm tea at that point. What on earth were they talking about? They stood there with no hint of irony, claiming that their mega supplier organization was acting with nothing but love and support for others working in that space and doing everything they could to ensure that everyone worked in harmony. Well, that surprised me because that wasn't what I expected and understood to be the case. In fact, just the week before, we'd been working with that exact company at a, a not to be named council who had been asked by them to help put together some data sets to do some new and interesting things with them. And some of that data had been held 
by this mega supplier. They'd been, should we say, less than engaging with our engineers and data scientists up until that point. We had planned to ingest the data they held and use it to power some insights, which the council could then use to directly improve the lives of their residents. The day of that ingestion arrived. We'd done everything we could, set up everything from our side and informed that company of our, supply, our plans to get started. Only our plans couldn't work because that mega supplier decided with no consultation at all to simply switch their APIs off. That was it. We couldn't access the data as planned. So all of that work, time, money, and effort had effectively been wasted. And thanks to the contractual situation between the mega supplier and the council, there was pretty much nothing anyone could do about it. So was that the supportive, productive, collegiate ecosystem they were now on stage speaking about? A year or so earlier, I'd actually been speaking with someone I knew who'd been part of a startup for a couple of years. They'd been trying to use modern tools, systems and processes to build a niche tool for a very specific part of the council, which they knew was really unsupported. Their tool aimed to fix a problem space they were intimately familiar with. And they'd done loads of user research, speaking with councils up and down the country to get their input. They'd used GDS inspired processes and standards to build an MVP to show people. They'd spent a year trying to get councils on board. Hell, they just wanted one single council to start using their tool for free so they could learn and develop it further. And with money being so tight across the sector, getting a better tool for free and being able to make sure it evolved into something even more valuable, I mean, that's an amazing opportunity, right? Well, they had actually been forced to stop and shut up shop entirely because Every single council they went to had given them the same feedback. They love the tool as it is. It's leagues ahead of what they were forced to use. And they'd love for it to get even better, but they wouldn't be able to get involved as they'd been promised that similar functionality would be coming from their mega supplier. They knew it almost certainly wouldn't happen. They knew it would take months or even years for that functionality to arrive. And that when it did, it would essentially be just a rehash of other existing tools and probably wouldn't be fit for purpose. But their hands were tied. It had been promised. And that promise had also focused on the fact that the other tools and systems provided by that mega supplier were the only ones they were designed to be used with. They weren't about to allow external tools to plug into it easily. Even those which could plug in certainly wouldn't be able to easily or freely move their data around because they didn't have API support. In fact, if they ever wanted to build API support, the council would have to pay through the nose for it. And that was despite the fact that the council knew they were already paying more than their neighbors for using basically an inferior version of their tool. They also knew that they were paying less than other people for it, so they didn't want to rock the boat too much. But as a result, they'd had to, be, my friend's company had been forced out of the market despite being agile, cheap, and meeting the needs of the sector. So I ask again, is, is that the supportive, productive, collegiate mindset that that mega supplier was talking about? I share those two anecdotes not to shame or attack any one or two suppliers. We all know which handful of suppliers dominate the various parts of the market. And we've all got our own stories to tell. Whatever part of the public sector digital landscape they're working in, the story is invariably the same. A small number of suppliers dominate the market and smaller suppliers simply have no way of competing. That is not an ecosystem. 
is at this point, it's probably worth taking a step back from digital just to spend a little bit of time breaking down what an ecosystem actually is, because the similarities between the digital and natural spaces are remarkable. For those who have seen any of my talks, I'm now going to take a customary diversion and shamelessly go on an analogy tour and go on that bit of a tangent now. So let's start by talking about ecosystems. So a dictionary definition of an ecosystem is a geographic area where plants, animals and other organisms, as, as well as weather and landscape, work together to form a bubble of life. They contain biotic or living parts, as well as abiotic or non-living parts. And those biotic factors include plants, animals and other organisms. I mean, that all makes sense, right? A whole host of things that are living and non-living working together in balance to perpetuate life and harmony for all. That's not to say there aren't competing interests in there, but in total, all of those interests sustain the habitat and make sure that everyone can survive and that many can thrive. Throw off the balance just a bit, however, and things start to change. If one element gets too powerful, then others suffer until the chain reaction of events has long lasting impacts that make even those powerful elements suffer. You see, it's the balance of life that matters. It's the interoperating of all the elements of that system that make everything work and which make for a richer, more diverse, more interesting and more sustainable whole. That's what symbiosis I mean, it's all about. Creating a mutually beneficial relationship between different people or groups and no better example of this is having you imagine the use of wolves to sustain salmon fishing in Yellowstone. Bear with me, it goes back to digital soon. Now, wolves had been seen as a risk to people and livestock in the Yellowstone National Park for a long time. So over the years, they've basically been driven to extinction. Every wolf in the entire national park was hunted down and killed. In the short term, that was seen as a, a beneficial gain in the area. Wolf attacks on people and livestock were eliminated entirely. So people were pretty happy for a while. They'd seen a need, found a single solution and went all in on it because it seemed like the simplest, easiest, cheapest way to meet their needs. Now came the unforeseen consequences. Removing the wolves did indeed deal with one problem, but it also enabled the local elk population to explode. Humans had just removed their natural main predators, so the elk were more than happy with how things were turning out. Over the next decade or so, the elk population doubled and nearly doubled again. Elk are huge grazers. I, I didn't know how much, how much and much about them until I started researching for this talk, but they devour grass, shrubs, trees, everything green. And over the years, they utterly de decimated Yellowstone's plant life. That meant that small animals like rabbits and mice couldn't use those plants to hide from their own predators like they normally would. So their populations plummeted along with the eagles and the hawks that hunted them. Grizzly bears would helplessly watch as herds of elk ate all their berries. So unlike me, they weren't able to bulk up and build up the fat layers they needed before hibernation began. Bees and pollinating birds found fewer flowers to feed on, Songbirds had fewer trees to nest in. They all suffered. Even the Yellowstone River itself was affected. 
elk normally spend very little time near the water for fear of ambush by wolves. But now there were no wolves. There were no such fears. So the elk, they got used to gathering in huge herds next to those rivers. They devoured all the nearby plant life, including plants which helped to keep the riverbanks in place. So the rivers just got wider and shallower. The hooves destroyed the earth next to the rivers, filling the water with clouds of soil. I mean, it changed the environment for everything in it. And there were no trees nearby, so beavers couldn't build dams. So all of the local amphibious and fish life suffered, including the salmon, who all but disappeared. So the initial problem had been solved in the short term, but overall the habitat was sick and dying. In 1995, 41 wolves were released back into Yellowstone National Park. Since then, the elk population has slimmed down from 17,000 to about 4,000. The wolf numbers have settled at around 300, 350. But there had been some fears that the wolves would just wipe out all of the elk. But instead, they've proved to be a really stabilizing force. As with all natural predators, typically the weakest prey are picked off. So actually the elk population overall is more healthy and robust. The elk themselves are now going back to the role they have played so well in the wider ecosystem, grazing at an appropriate scale and not ruining the spaces that others should inhabit. The simple fact that the elk were now scared of spending much time at rivers kept them away more, so trees survived and contributed to the overall balance once again. Clean water, more trees, well, that's paradise for beavers, and their dams are now creating new habitats for fish. The rivers are narrowing back to their previous widths and deepening, thanks to the dams and the strong riverbanks, and of course, well, that means people can go salmon fishing again. Yep, the salmon have now returned to an environment that had previously been perfect for them, and that's now returning to that state. Some people, probably the elk amongst them if they could, you know, understand things and speak, they argued that creating an environment that would lessen the hold that the elk herds had on, the, on, on things overall, that it would be a bad thing. They were worried that introducing a small number, number of hungry wolves would upset for how things have been for 40 years or more. Even though they all knew that it wasn't working well enough as it was, but they were familiar with it. They feared change. But instead, everything has benefited. The natural balance has been restored. There's still a place for the herds as massive, slow and ponderous as they were, but moving to a much more balanced landscape has created symbiosis, which has benefited every part of that ecosystem. So that's an example from the natural world. But what if we were able to translate that to the digital world instead? Replace the name of your favorite mega supplier with the name of the elk. And the story sounds remarkably similar. Mega suppliers like super organisms, they're effectively, they're beasts who do one thing and have done it for a long time. They just don't need to be agile as, well, has got no competition. If left unchecked, they can grow to immense size and impose themselves on all parts of the, of the digital world. They take up room that other smaller, more agile organizations would normally inhabit. And essentially, they can make it impossible for them to operate just by promising that some features will be available on some far off roadmap. It's enough to stop most services and procurement teams from being able to turn to more agile suppliers and the contractual situations stipulate stipulations that these mega suppliers are able to impose. It's really deemed worthwhile to do so because there's no real con. 
if there's no real competition. There's no incentive for the mega suppliers to dynamically deliver what those other agile suppliers would do. So they're able to let innovation go while they graze and get fat on their core deliverables. For the elk, that was you know them trampling all over the rivers because they don't care about them while they got fat grazing on grass. But for mega suppliers, this is them ignoring the need to move quickly to deliver value at no additional cost. They can make more money delivering their existing tools and delivering minimum viable innovation in order to justify just another price hike. They know that there are few alternatives in the same way that I'm sure the elk knew that the locals would only be able to replace them with buffalo or bison. The end result would be the same, even for those who could be bothered to spend the months or years forcing that change through. Mega suppliers know that there's no alternative of comparable size who covers as much ground. So they know for every client who moves to one of their rivals, they'll pick up one in return. They've got no predators. And they either don't know what a truly balanced symbiotic ecosystem is, or they don't care. And that's not good enough. But how do we get here? How do we get to a place where we've got this small number of mega suppliers dominating our markets? When we've been hearing of the need to move to an ecosystem of suppliers for so long. A good place to start is procurement. Now, I want to be really clear here. I'm not blaming procurement teams. Procurement is a hugely complex job with massive limitations and in the current environment, it's under more pressure than ever before. Procurement teams, they're being asked to procure software that does more, but with less budget than they've ever had available in the past. And, and that's no mean task. They truly, truly have my sympathy. And having worked in the public sector myself for nearly a decade, uh, and having been part of countless procurement processes, I'm really sensitive to the pressures they're under. But that being said, the way organizations procure software is, to put it bluntly, wrong. We somehow got to a place where too many systems are procured wholesale in one go, with a massive list of features handed to procurement teams, which have usually been written or, or shaped by one of the mega suppliers themselves. Procurement teams are then given the instruction of, yep, yeah, go buy us that. This feature-led procurement process details out basically what those mega suppliers already offer, effectively making it impossible for anyone else to stand any chance by proposing something different. If there's more than one mega supplier in the market, their feature sets, well, let's be honest, they're broadly identical. I, they might have a little terminology or user flow differences, but effectively, they're similar sets of bloated software which are designed to keep data internal, to only work nicely with other systems that that supplier supplies, and to try and stifle innovation from anyone else along the way. Outcome-based procurement exercises they're nothing new. They're not revolutionary and they've been proven to work more effectively and drive more innovation than feature-based procurement exercises ever will. Just creating a list of requirements generally leads to a binary answer. Have you got this feature? Yes. Have you got that feature? No. How well that given set of features will actually meet user needs and outcomes is usually hidden under the sheer number of features being requested. Because those requirements, they don't define the business need in terms that are easily articulated or measured. But they do represent that buyer's view of what the solution needs to look like. So it's no wonder that so many suppliers might just list out their features and expect that list to answer all of a buyer's questions. By taking an outcomes-led approach, 
Well, you start to look at the processes that need to be in place for your service to operate more effectively. It's about more than just replicating the status quo. It's about procuring 21st century technology to meet 21st century needs. I mean, I know this is more easily said than done. Just sending a message out saying, look, we want to buy something that meets service needs. Well, it's next to useless. And it certainly won't help suppliers meet those needs because we won't actually understand them. Organizations need to set out what they're hoping to achieve in a bit of detail, but do so in a way which allows suppliers to tell you how they would meet your needs rather than simply giving them a list of boxes to tick off. I looked at one recent procurement exercise which had about 700 different features, page after page after page of feature requests. I mean, covering the most banal of requests and all adding up to a picture of a massive system that no small or medium sized supplier could ever hope to offer if it didn't already exist. And to top it off, the organization running the process even stated up front, they want one supplier who could do the lot. They won't even entertain consortium proposals or any proposal with integrations between suppliers. They didn't want integrations to be attached to any element of critical importance, no matter how stable the integrations. I mean, what message is that sending out to suppliers? To those hoping to get involved in shaking things up and offering something different? It's just saying, don't bother. They'd rather not worry about it because they know that company would need to spend years millions of pounds of their own R&D money to even come close to being successful by building out an entire platform. It was too complicated. Unless they could do it all at once, up front, with, and do so knowing there was no guarantee of success at the end. Even if you could probably meet the ultimate outcomes, not interested. I just felt that things were set up to be too big of a challenge. SMEs aren't given that opportunity and they should just give up entirely. It was also telling the mega suppliers themselves that they could just relax a bit. All they need to do, tick those feature boxes, maybe add a handful of extra ones on top, most of which would probably never be used. You know, start cashing your checks. Name your own terms, put whatever clauses in the contracts you want. Just be safe in the knowledge that all you and all other mega suppliers basically peerless and safe. A better option, in my opinion, would have been for that procuring organization to put the effort into setting out the outcomes they wanted to achieve in order for them to deliver a top draw set of outcomes for their service users, set out user needs, minimum requirements and user journeys, and then step back, see what suppliers can offer rather than just asking, do you enable web forms? To quote something George Patton once said, never tell people how to do things, tell them what needs to be done and let them surprise you with their ingenuity. That lesson applies to digital procurement as much as it does to any other walk of life. There'd be nothing stopping those mega suppliers from stepping in and at that point proposing their own solutions, but it would also enable groups of other smaller, more agile suppliers to team up and meet the whole need together. Delivering tools which were linked together through APIs, through data, and through common standards, and in doing so, break the stranglehold that any single supplier of legacy systems would actually have. They could much more easily enforce these open standards moving forward knowing that any single supplier that fell foul of those could be decoupled from the whole and replaced by someone who met them. Mega suppliers could meet many or some of those needs, particularly where stability and scale were beneficial. But they'd be forced to play nicely with everyone else and open up the data that they'd previously locked away. Smaller suppliers 
could innovate to their heart's content. We could build tools that had real value and also tools which enhance every other part of the system that they're integrated with. In short, we'd finally have that ecosystem we've so long hoped for. Oh, how naive I can hear people saying at their screens right now. Uh, we don't live in a utopia where suppliers working together and where data easily should be able to be shared. It's just not that easy. Well, well no, of course it's not. It's, it's going to be bloody hard work and, and it will take time. But what are the alternatives? How else are we going to drive the changes we need? Are we just going to sit back and expect things to get better by themselves? Are we going to trust that a really small number of mega suppliers will drastically up their innovation levels of their own accord, that they'll start giving every one of their customers the same levels of service, they'll start lowering costs and raising standards? If you do think that, I'd really like to ask who's being naive now. No. We need to go through that pain. We need to put the work in and deal with those challenges now because we just can't afford another five or 10 or 20 years of this. We can't afford to reinforce a situation where small and medium sized businesses aren't able to bring their expertise together and create a truly distributed, stable, symbiotic ecosystem just because they're not individually able to offer all things to all people from day one. By the way, it's probably worth me reinforcing here that I don't see very large companies and mega suppliers ever not being needed or not having a place in that ecosystem. Far from it, in fact. There are absolutely areas where scale is of huge value. The ability to do multiple things can offer economies of scale and where systems can be designed to work better together with each other because they're developed by the same people. And it's natural that successful companies will grow and take up larger shares of their market as they offer more and richer products. However, because we're currently not binding any company to truly open development from the start, we're not demanding both interoperability and free movement of data between tools, systems, and products outside of that supplier's offering. We're allowing those who are and have been successful in the past to pull the ladder up after themselves and stop innovation. I don't know why organizations do it when it clearly leads to inferior products which are more expensive and less innovative. I, I don't know why information is allowed to be locked away and not freely and securely used to improve the digital offerings for all service users. And I don't know why companies are so scared of encouraging competition. Those companies who are truly confident they can deliver excellence and value, well, they'd have nothing to fear from the introduction of a, a few wolves into the digital ecosystem. If their products truly are all, their, all that they claim to be, the users will continue to use them and to love them. Competitors and frenemies alike will come and go, but, but they'll continue to offer the bulk of the digital requirements they previously offered, previously offered. They shouldn't be scared. In reality, however, I would place good money on the fact that probably this wouldn't be the case. Like the elk herds in Yellowstone, sooner rather than later, the weaker, older, sicker parts of that digital herd will be picked off. Smaller suppliers working to, to well-known, stable standards would be able to innovate effectively and efficiently. They'll be able to make improvements to processes which would not only secure them a place in that ecosystem, but would also strengthen the places of others at the same time. Everyone would win. And not least, 
the end users. This isn't a pipe dream either. Organizations need to start being more brave with procurement and making the demands that are gonna pay off in the long term. Let's be frank, the public sector can't afford not to. It can't afford to keep paying huge contracts over extensive periods of time to a small number of suppliers and just relying on their corporate goodwill to make sure that they're not going to give them the best possible tools and receive the best possible return on investment if it's not working. Companies have got no need to open up their data for, e for others to easily use, so they won't. They won't evolve things that don't need to involve, evolve unless they're forced to. Uh, I've mentioned data again. It really is one of the most precious assets the public sector has. It's the thing that can unlock more value than almost anything else available. And the thing which is so often overlooked in terms of mandating requirements and then, importantly, enforcing those mandates. It's not uncommon at all for those standards which were agreed at procurement stage to then be delayed when it comes to implementation and then ultimately forgotten about altogether. But we can't accept that. Not if we're ever going to have any chance of creating this symbiotic ecosystem. We've all agreed we should be aiming for. Data should just flow from one system to another seamlessly. It should be clearly structured in a way that's neutral and most importantly, out of the control of any single supplier. Every supplier should understand those data structures and they should be able and willing to build their tools based on that while, while themselves adding depth to that data, whether at the top of the data cycle or the bottom of it. Companies and the tools they build should all remember we're only mere custodians of data. Ultimately, it belongs to the end users and is processed by the organizations they gave it to. Locking it away and preventing free and easy access is what's well, at best unethical. And we all claim to be ethical in terms of our products and values. Of course, as soon as data is able to flow freely between systems, it stops being limited. There, there are so many different ways of managing data, combining it in different ways and using it to drive change and improvement. Some people still believe data lakes are the future. You know, vast collections of data that can be dipped into and built upon in ways which unlock real insight. Hackney Council, for example, have been doing fabulous work in this area. They've combined previously siloed data sets and they are using it to change lives. A, a recent example of this really did change a life. They unlocked three very specific data sets, uh, vulnerable people, shielding individuals and housing repairs. With the thinking being that behind that vulnerable, uh, thinking behind that being that vulnerable people who had been shielding may well be feeling alone and would, would benefit from some targeted outreach. And they also understood clearly houses deteriorate over time with each house having an expected level of repair requests that you'd expect to see over time for things that were broken or needed fixing. Hackney combined these three data sets and, and started calling these individuals who were at the top of that list. And one of the very first people they got through to uh, was an elderly man who, who had been shielding through the pandemic. He did indeed have some housing repairs, but he hadn't been able to get through using the normal phone channels to get it logged. And as a result, he tried to fix it himself. In doing so, not only had he made the issue worse, he'd injured himself. He'd effectively felt lost, alone, and abandoned by everyone around him. Within two weeks of that first phone call, his repair had been completely dealt with. He'd been given real medical care and social support. And for the first time in a long time, he just felt cared for and not alone. Just by freeing up a, a handful of data sets, the council 
had fundamentally changed and uh, possibly saved his life. Just imagine what we could do if all data sets could be used in the same way. Data lakes may well prove valuable, but some feel even better than a data lake are data meshes. This decentralized approach to data architecture, where it's where a lot of the more forward thinking eyes are looking. Like the shift from one mega supplier with their mega system, which does everything, to smaller microsystems, which work in harmony well, a data mesh ties together distributed data sets, which remain in their domain, but supports the mindset of, of data as a service. It decentralizes things and federates data ownership amongst those data domain owners who are each held accountable for providing their data as products, while also facilitating communication between that distributed data across all those different locations. It, it's super important because it enables data to be better used for different purposes and on a greater scale. And rather than relying on one central platform to do all the transformational heavy lifting, each data set is designated to or designed to operate with all the others, but while retaining its own provenance. It also means data teams can do more as they've got far more pipes of data to work with. And it has the added benefit of, well, it's being platform agnostic. So you don't fall into that trap of one single entity controlling it all. But at the moment though, we're still faced with proprietary tech, with completely competing data schemas, with contracts which make it impossible to open them up. And where even if it is possible, it never comes for free. Mega suppliers have encouraged a one ring to rule them all mentality when it comes to the tools that organizations have at their disposal. And the way data is held, well, it doesn't make it available for reuse. We need to throw that mindset into the bowels of Mount Doom where it belongs. So what next? Where should we go? If you take away any calls to action from all of these ramblings, these are the three things I think we should be doing. Firstly, challenge. Challenge every single supplier when they even hint at being part of a digital ecosystem, whether they're large or small, every single one of them needs to accept and agree that the symbiosis between them all is vital if you, the client, are to thrive. It's not enough for them to point to some stale APIs and an old case study of how they integrated with one single supplier back in the day. What are they doing now? What are they doing in the coming six months? How are they gonna enable and actively encourage other companies to work with them to make their combined offerings better? Secondly, push back on each and every procurement exercise, which involves a long list of features. Prioritize the outcomes required instead of just a list of features and actively encourage bidding organizations to work together to meet the whole thing rather than requiring one platform to do everything. The value each part of that bring will compound all the others and can well unlock huge and rapid improvements in a way that a single supplier simply never could. Thirdly, demand that all of your suppliers agree with free, no cost access to every data set they hold on your behalf. It's your data, not theirs. And if you want to move it around, you should have the right and the ability to do so. Challenge on the ecosystem, push back on lists for procurement and unlock the data. Now, of course, Scott Logic, we're not the only company out there that operates in this way already. There are plenty of others that do incredible work. And we're all aching to be part of a thriving symbiotic ecosystem. Let's break the stranglehold that these mega suppliers have enjoyed for too long. 
let's let, let's open up opportunities for us to come in and pick off the weakest, the oldest, and the sickest parts of that herd. And then you can sit back and we'll just watch the future happen. You can watch digital nature heal itself. And you don't even have to want to go salmon fishing to appreciate that the fish will come back to the river. As ever, always happy to speak to any of you about anything I've spoken about. And maybe take you fishing one day. Thanks very much.